Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who's done most of his research for the World Cup Group A preview. <laughs> his name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello and is that true? Um, I mean, if you're like my high school math teacher asking if I finished a project, then yeah, totally. Almost done. <laughs> almost done. Just a few, uh, got to dot the T's, cross the I's, all the stuff. But you have been working on it, right? Because we are. You didn't on, like my joke. On Thursday, I, I heard it. <laughs> on Thursday, we are doing our first World Cup 2018 preview. We're yep. going to be looking at Group A. We're going to be going in depth. That show will be coming at you, I'm going to say, late Thursday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Fair? Uh, it works for me. Okay. Today's show. Yep is a question spectacular. We have five listener questions for you. We sure do. Up first is one from Carlos Garcia, who asks, World Cup songs, are they good or mostly annoying? <laughs> do you have a favorite? <laughs> wait, mind- wait, what's the, what's the just answer to that first part of the question? Mostly annoying. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite? Mine is France 98, The Cup of Life by Ricky Martin. It makes me want to run outside and play until this day. Is there uh, a first ever World Cup song? Um, actually, I'll go ahead and just say there is, and it's my pick for the best ever World Cup song. So there you go. <laughs> right, what are we talking about when we say World Cup song? Mm-hmm. Are we talking official World Cup song that FIFA and the World Cup hosts say this is the World Cup song? Or are we talking about any World Cup songs that just get released about soccer around the time of the tournament? I think Carlos and my answer per- is Carlos is asking about it. My answer pertains to the official World Cup okay. anthem. Like the, said, the Cup of Life was the official song, right? It was yeah. one of the official songs. Yeah. Which it's confusing because you have different songs for different languages. Mm-hmm. Then you also have corporate sponsor tie-ins. So then you have at least um, an official song, mm-hmm. an official anthem. Those are two different things. Oh and then you normally have a Coca official Coca-Cola song Evidently. of the World Cup, mm-hmm. which is about soccer but also features stuff about fizziness usually. Yeah, yeah. almost always. <laughs> yeah, fizziness is central to every Coke song, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so I think – so to answer the initial question or part of the initial question, the first World Cup song that I saw, first World Cup anthem, uh, was in 1962 – Yes, uh, I saw it, the same it Chile was World Cup. Right? By Los Ramblers, uh, El Rock del Mundial. I love that song. Is that just I the love, rock of the world? I believe of? so. The World Cup rock kind of? Kind sure, of? Yeah. something like that. World Cup rock, I yeah. like it. Because it does have that 1950s yeah. uh, sort of like... I, I, I liken it to an early Beatles song. Yeah. I, I, I listen to the Beatles anthology. You know, you hear their sort uh-huh. of... Uh, when yeah. they're first practicing and stuff, and mm-hmm. it's a little ramshackle, but it's kind of good. That's yeah. what this reminded me it of. It reminded me of Chilean Elvis meets Chilean Jerry Lewis Elvis. meets uh, Bill Haley. That sort of like... I think Chilean Elvis is the Las Vegas Lights mascot. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> <laughs> But Bill Haley is the one who does like uh, Rock Around the Clock Tonight. Yeah. That one. Yes. It's a little bit of that sort of like da 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 So I think you hit on this as we, we briefly discussed this mm-hmm. coming into the office, right? The, the World Cup song tends to represent the current popular musical trends, which in the like, early... hard though. Yeah. Like really, like we're going all out with like whatever's popular right early now. Early 60s, it was that kind of rock and roll-y type stuff, right? Yeah. yeah, but I think it culminates for me at least in 1994's Glory Land, the <laughs> official anthem of uh, the US World Cup, which is already sort of a weird one. But Daryl Hall and his Lion's Mane haircut, it is like the most... They have taken everything about the 90s that you think of, like early, mid-90s rock, yeah. and they're just like, this is going to be popular forever. Let's do it all the way. <laughs> it is a sight to behold. <laughs> um, my answer, World Cup songs, are they good or mostly annoying? Mm-hmm. I find them really annoying. The yep. official ones, mm-hmm. the official uh, uh, World Cup anthems and songs, and the sponsored Coca-Cola ones, I find relentlessly sort of upbeat in a way that misunderstands what soccer is about. But what about when they're stolen by Shakira? That doesn't do it for you? <laughs> yeah, that's all, so angry. Actually, weirdly, that's one of the better ones because I think the... It's stolen by from other different other yes. musicians throughout the years. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. the Waka Waka song is yeah. sort of... Yeah, I think it's got like... It's got a... Um, what's the word? A genuineness to it, mm-hmm. an authenticity to it yeah. that is heavily borrowed, let's say, because it was That's an authentic song elsewhere, sure. right? Mm-hmm. The rest of the songs tend to be about how we're all one world and we're going to score a goal yeah. and everybody together. And though I like, you know, I'm sort of a weird idealist. Mm-hmm. I like that message. But when it's sung with such insincerity into a pop beat, I find it really cloying and uh, it doesn't work for me. It, it's weird because I know one of the nominees for the 2018 World Cup was either Germany or Brazil. That was the name of the song, and that was pretty fitting for – that's a made-up thing. Uh, but it is, you're right, though. I think it is sort of like – it doesn't that, really capture a lot else aside from like what you're theoretically going yeah. for, which then makes me think of the FIFA movie, whatever, like whatever mm-hmm. that game movie was called, that it's all about how FIFA is the best. Yep. And it's sort of – once you 
get to that level, it becomes a little bit disconcerting. I mean, so we have um, we have a Coca Cola song already mm-hmm. for the 2018 World Cup. It is called Colors. Um, it's by Jason Derulo, who's not an artist I'm familiar mm-hmm. with. Um, so again, this is the Coca Cola one. The official one will come out yeah. uh, later and later. But it features lyrics like "We are the champions," um, and "Can you taste the feeling?" You see, because it's the official Coca Cola song. And then Can just, you and taste then just the ends feeling? fizz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one year it'll be called Is Pepsi Okay? <laughs> <laughs> or it'll be called Pepsi Is Not Okay. Or Pepsi Goes Out in the Group Stage. I, I feel like if, it's, if it were Coca Cola still with the sponsorship, it would be unnamed secondary soda. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that okay? <laughs> so here's the thing for me mm. um, I do like World Cup songs, but I always like the unofficial ones that more capture the mood of what soccer is really all about okay. here's the best example i'll give you do you know what the official song of the 1990 world cup was i do because it was i don't know what it was called but i did listen to it and it was by eduardo benato it's called un estata italiana uh-huh. parentheses to be number one okay right uh-huh. i thought i was going to trick you because most people would say that the official anthem of the 1990 world cup is Luciano Pavarotti singing Nessun Dorma, ah. the operatic mm-hmm. thing, right? Yeah. That was nothing to do with the official tournament. It was just that Pavarotti and the three tenors gave a performance on the eve of the World Cup being hosted in Italy where they sung Nessun Dorma mm-hmm. and it was really popular and it became this sort of unofficial anthem. Yeah. But Nessun Dorma, for those who don't speak Ital- Italian, um, means none shall sleep as in like none shall sleep tonight, which Ooh. is like that really yeah. is like a weirdly captures the essence of being a soccer fan much more than to be number one. We yeah. are champions. Yeah. Can you taste the fizz? And the word of is pretty good. Um, is he? I'm not familiar. I, I, this is not going to help. He's no lost rumblers. This is not going to help the tweets that say that I'm a hipster. Uh, I have his record. <laughs> um, oh, no. So it's from when I worked in a record store. And it was, see, that is the thing I would say about working in a record store yeah. is it affords you the opportunity to be like, sure, why not? I'm here for eight hours. I'll put that on. And if it's good, it's good. And then some random stuff ends up being really good. That was one of them. But getting to your point of mm. the, the, the anthem should be called something like, it'll probably be Germany or Brazil. Yeah. I like those sort of more wry um, songs about the World Cup. One mm. of my favourites being, in 1998, Scotland qualified for the World Cup. Scottish band Delamitri, are you familiar with them? Uh, Delamitri, a Scottish band. They released a song called Don't Come Home Too Soon. <laughs> That's right. Which is a really That's sort right. of funny but also genuine feeling that people would have about Scotland in 1998, mm. right? Um, other titles could be like, please don't make this the last time we go for a long time. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like Some of that sort of uh, bitterness and disappointment that is yeah. part of actually watching a team at the World Cup is much more genuine as opposed to we are all one big world kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and but that also is like a little bit more tongue-in-cheek. It's less yes. sort of like corporate rock, yes. <laughs> if you will. Like, like making this sort of – like if you were to have a band in, in 2022 writing a song like we're back for the US, <laughs> maybe that's a bit too soon. But like – that speaks a little bit more to like the feeling within the country at the time yes. versus we are all one, but one must win. Like, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's a strange approach to like, isn't this great how wonderful things are? Give us your money, Coca-Cola. <laughs> like, genu- if you did a genuine World Cup song that had that wry sense of humor, mm-hmm. you would call it like 31 losers or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something that really gets at the disappointment of watching 30, 31 losers. <laughs> That's perfect. That that should absolutely be a World Cup song. Um, I do want to close – well, at least I'm going to close by saying – The whole show? uh, Yeah, that's it. We're out. (laughs) I do love 1978's uh, El Mundial by Ennio Morricone. I didn't listen to that. Uh, It's really Why do I know that name? Because he has written the score to so, so many movies. Uh, The Thing, The Good, Bad, The Ugly, The Untouchables, The Hateful Eight. He is that guy and he is terrific. The Spaghetti Western guy. And it sounds sort of Spaghetti Western-y and I love it. What was it? I that, want to hear it again. Isn't that what he did? There yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> you and I are just proving our worth as singers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, seriously, go watch Glory Land. Go watch that video <laughs> by Daryl Hall, and it's phenomenal. Notably, not Oats, just Hall. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else to add here? I think I've added plenty. You've added plenty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So also worth noting again that uh, Colors by Jason De- Derulo mm-hmm. um, is the Coca-Cola anthem. There should be a World Cup song and a World Cup anthem released more as we get much, much closer to the tournament. All right. I thought they have a short lead time because they're not short of attention um, on World Cup things, re- World yeah. Cup related things around the start of the tournament. I would say so. Okay, next question mm-hmm. comes from Ken Klein. I liked this question. It's very open-ended and probably hard to answer, but I like it, Ken. Ken wants to know, can you come up with better imagery 
for soccer formations. You have expressed dissatisfaction, he says to you and I, um, with how well the parallel lines imagery succeeds. For example, 4-4-2, 4-2-3-1, how well that succeeds in describing a team's formation. Do you have a suggestion for better imagery? Mm-hmm. This is half a question and half a challenge. Well, I would say... I don't. I would just say take soccer one, make soccer face is the answer. That's obviously the answer. <laughs> I would say I take slight issue with. I don't necessarily have a problem with like four two three one. Like if an announcer says they're in a four two three one, if that's roughly the case, it's obviously them trying to do shorthand to explain roughly what yes. the tactics are. I think what I get frustrated by is when people then take that as gospel and it yeah. becomes this weird like no they're clearly in a four three three no they're clearly in a four two three yeah. one like that it's not that different. Our problem with those numbers yeah. is that formations are dynamic and mm-hmm. changeable. Like you can like change formations during a game, or a formation can be a thing that looks one way when you're attacking, looks a different way when you're defending, looks mm-hmm. one way when you decide to press, it looks another way when you decide to absorb pressure. And just like a list of numbers isn't always good enough to accurately describe that. So can challenge to us is Mm -hmm. how else could it be done so i've got two um and and both of them i think could be done with relative ease but i think and i think it's based on the idea in my mind that a lot of times starting lineups are sort of a thing you do when you've got five minutes until kickoff and they're usually like and here's your four and here's your two here's your three here's one let's keep you going you don't really hear a lot of this guy's going to be here as opposed to here and so what i would like to see is maybe a lineup based on expected starting position that you could base that off of say fifa's average position charts if it's a a larger game i'm sure there's other ones that show you the average position at the end of each game yeah so then you could see like oh marcelo is going to be consistently 20 yards further like further forward than the rest of the defense so then if the starting 11 showed you that it would give you a better idea of what is actually going to happen so you in imagine the, the graphic on the screen yeah. would have Marcelo advanced up the left right? or like, and maybe ex- it would have the, the yeah. left winger sort of tucking in to allow him to overlap mm. if that's a thing that actually is, is going to happen but and that's the graphic, right? That's not how we well, talk about it. Well, for, but I want to say, I know you're then going to have people say like, yeah, but that's expected. That's not actually what's happening. Nor are the 4-2-3-1 lineups that you see. That's basically the broadcasters taking their best guess mm-hmm. as to what they're going to be doing Short based time, on right? either yeah, conversations yeah. with the coach. But it's not like the coach gives them a lineup that's like written out that says 4-2-3-1 or anything but like do that. Do you want people to d- describe it as 4-2-3-1 with Marcelo pushing forward? So you just want like extra phrases afterwards to describe it? Maybe? No, I mean I think it's I think it would be better to show the like instead of doing like here's your defense and four players, but to be like here's where we think Marcelo is going to be. Here's yeah, this yeah, one, no, this I, one, I understand on on the screen. Yeah, but you're talking literally about the imagery that goes on the screen, maybe mm-hmm. that we see on TV. Yeah, okay, that's I was right. talking more as if we were talking about it on a podcast. Okay, but I guess maybe you're you're right. He says imagery, so on the screen makes more sense. Yeah, right? and I think and then my other aspect or my idea of that like playing off of that one would be like like expected zones of influence, maybe. So then you mm. could see like ooh, they're going to have a bunch of players we think on this side of the field but maybe not over here so if the other team takes advantage of that i like the idea then of the opening like graphic at least again i've gone kind of visual yeah showing you oh this guy's going to be here that leaves space over here so somebody else could occupy that and again it mm-hmm. sets you up better to understand what might happen in the game as opposed to so you point this, guy's out here, this guy's basically. here this guy's here this guy's here this guy's here what you point out the floors yeah like exactly. it's some horrible sorority pledge week <laughs> wow you know what i'm saying i do know what you're saying i've seen this stuff in movies and been traumatized by it. <laughs> At that time, you pledged a sorority briefly yes, for was, a 90s sitcom. I was rejected. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so one way I would do mm-hmm. this is to essentially have two formations listed. Mm-hmm. So you would say 4-5-1 in defense, 4-3-3 in attack. Mm-hmm. And you could even show that on the screen as how the five, def- five midfielders would collapse back. Um, but then in a 4-3-3, you would show the two wingers pushing forward and maybe like one defensive midfielder holding and two central midfielders attacking a bit more. So you would show that here's your defensive formation, here's your attacking formation, and it might give people a better understanding about the fluidity of it. And maybe in the, the pre-screen, I keep pointing at our TV like it's I, going to appear there. I think I've done that too. In the pre-match graphic, you could have those figures actually move on the screen, right? So then people who are not that familiar would understand, okay, that's what the right mid's going to do. Mm-hmm. He's going to drop in when they're defending, then he's going to launch himself forward when they attack. Yeah, so maybe it is just that simple as offense and defense, and you can kind of mm-hmm. then Two explain phases. the shifts a little bit more yeah. rather than just here's where we think they're going to be in a static image. The other thing I tried to work with mm-hmm. is a thing that has happened in the past with certain formations where they have been described in terms of what they look like. So I remember... The four three two one formation mm-hmm. being described as a Christmas tree because right. it looks like the shape of a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. The empty bucket midfield with the two deep line midfielders and two wingers and an empty bucket shape in the middle of the field. Just those that like imagery to describe a formation I really like. One of my favorites is the old WM formation, mm-hmm. which is a, essentially a, a what 
three two two three. Yep. Three two two three. So from top of the page down, it looks like uh, W M, like the two letters. I wish there was a way to do that for every single formation, but I'm not sure there is. Like, could the three four three be the hexagon? I mean, it's up to you, my friend. Uh, but I would say though that like we've gotten questions as to why is it called an empty bucket? It doesn't look like an empty bucket to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're still gonna get that. Like that's not an empty bucket. It's a bit like looking up at the stars and being like, that looks like farming equipment. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you really, you're really stretching it maybe a little bit. Because now I'm just wondering though, like, what is farming equipment to you? Do you mean like, like a a rake, or do you mean like <laughs> that's a thresher? <laughs> like that's an elaborate star system. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Like how people look up and be like, that's yeah. the flower. Yeah, and, I'm with you. And other people can be like, I don't see a flower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically it involves so – That wouldn't work so much. Maybe we just need like a giant like FIFA dictionary or encyclopedia that you just flip through until you find the image you like and it has a branded name next to it. Like the tortoise. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're playing a tortoise today. <laughs> it's tortoise versus groundhog. There Why not? Mm-hmm. Commence action. <laughs> yes. All right, Ken, we've tried. We've really tried. <laughs> I hope I hope we gave a satisfactory answer. I do. I really do like the idea of the graphic being ex- uh, expected starting position there. Expected so, starting position. So then when Marcelo is 20 yards further forward, you're not surprised, although you wouldn't be if it's Marcelo. So I maybe. want it all to be the shapes of farming equipment. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question is from Pete Johnson. Mm-hmm. Pete Johnson asks, has anyone ever been given a red card for fouling their own Teammate, mm-hmm. I think this is. I think this question came in before the Sasha Kleshton uh, versus mm-hmm. is it El Munir, yeah. um, the Orlando defender, before their little um, set two for mm-hmm. Orlando at the weekend. It was very timely. All right. So first of all, I'm going to say, uh, being married to a poten- potential future lawyer, it depends on what you mean by foul. <laughs> uh, because no, if Daryl Grove accidentally slide tackles me while I am dribbling on a breakaway, he is not going to get a red card, even if we're on the same team. What if it's a denial of goal scoring opportunity? I doubt that. You're probably going to get investigated for match fixing. But even then, <laughs> especially now, what I have seen is a lot of clips of referees giving free kicks because I accidentally slid into Daryl and he gives a free kick because it seems like it's a foul. And then the other team losing their minds because they clearly <laughs> should not have gotten a free kick against them. Oh, um, that's why they shouldn't let colorblind people ref. <laughs> there we go. But what you what you will get, though, is uh ejections for violent conduct or striking, that is definitely different. You cannot just punch your own teammate and get away with yep, it. because it's violent conduct, and violent yeah. conduct in any form is a red card. And that has happened way more often than you would think. I only have one example. I've got three. Can I do my example sure. since I've only got one? Uh-huh. Okay, the one that came to my mind immediately after seeing Pete Johnson's question was 2005, yep. Kieran Dyer mm-hmm. versus Lee Boyer, yep. playing for Newcastle United against Aston Villa. So I've also seen Dyer's description of what happened. Um, which was he didn't pass to Lee Boyer multiple times. Boyer confronted him and asked why not. And Dyer basically said he wasn't passing to him because he didn't think Boyer was all that good at football. Oof. Lee Boyer launched into I'm him. I'm sure he didn't say it that meekly either. He did either. not. There yeah. Was, yeah, there was definitely expletives um, adapted as I, as, I read, as I read this out. Um, a fist fight commenced. They both threw punches. They both get red cards. Yep, that two players it. sent off yep. Newcastle versus Villa. I mean, and she that, didn't check the score, but I'm going to go out and say Newcastle did not win that game. That would make sense. I mean, <laughs> but that is kind of what happened. That's the common one. Is like uh, happened in December 2016. Preston North End teammates Jermaine Beckford and Owen. A- How would you do that one? E O I N. Owen. Owen. There yep. we go. See, this is I don't know. That's Owen, but like the Irish or Welsh way. All right. Yeah. Well, O W E N. Uh, Doyle. We're both sent off. Uh, closing minutes of a two to one loss to Sheffield Wednesday. My favorite one, which maybe I'll have to like tweet out or something. Uh, was a League 2 match between uh, Kevi, oof, that's a tough one, and Auxerre. Uh, you had two Auxerre players get into a fist fight, and it was actually an opponent that immediately reacted and broke them up and tried to separate them as much as he could. I think he got a few punches for his efforts. <laughs> but it does happen. Jens Lehmann was sent off for choking his own teammate, for failing to defend properly. So I think when people get really frustrated, especially hot-headed players... They might take it out on their own teammates, and then they'll both be sent to the stands. Oh, Jens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think, but yeah, so to answer, it's basically only with violent conduct incidents where it's that we deemed know unsafe of. to keep the two players on the field. Yeah, because I think it just makes sense, right? That's the only time yeah. that there will be any sort of clash, deliberate clash between two teammates. Yeah. Because I would imagine if a teammate did slide tackle another teammate, like say if I did that to you, mm-hmm. you probably would start raining punches down on me because <laughs> you'd be so angry, right? It's, it's going to be the prelude to a violent confrontation if one teammate tackles another teammate. Or just, or just more so like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> That's probably what it would be. I'd just be very confused. <laughs> Thank you to Pete mm-hmm. for that question. 
Are you ready for an ad break? I am indeed. All right. Other podcasts say they stop and then yep. they, they insert the ad. We read it live. Today's show is sponsored hey guys, by... Hey, we've got a quick, important message for you. <laughs> yeah, no. Today's show is sponsored by SeatGeek. Mm-hmm. SeatGeek makes ticket buying easier than it's ever been. You get the app on your phone. You open the app. You click to the event you want to go to. You see how much the tickets are. A couple of taps and you are there and you've got the lowest price. Hooray. Hooray. We're recording this Tuesday night after 8 p.m., which means the uh, Capitals playoff game against Tampa Bay is underway. Uh, so if you... I, from what I understand, you can use SeatGeek to see if the prices have uh, reduced dramatically after uh, the puck has dropped. So you could do that. or like you could look, empty seats. Yeah, I think so. Huh. Or you could look to see if there are tickets available for, uh, I believe it will be Thursdays, uh, hopefully the uh, final game of that series, speaking as a Capitals fan. <laughs> uh, you could look for tickets to that as well. So you just open the app, mm-hmm. look around, you can click on, so Caps at Home? Uh, yes. For yeah, these two games, so you yeah. get to DC and you can see what tickets are available and how much they cost. They use the color coding system, so you can automatically, instead of having to look at every seat and decide what's the best deal, Mm -hmm. they've got an orange, amber, red system to figure out what the best possible deal is. That checks out. The best possible deal is to get $20 off your first purchase. So if you download the SeatGeek app, you uh, open the settings tab, enter the promo code TSS, promo code TSS, you get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring today's Total Soccer Show. Now, we uh, will end this recording and go back to the show. Welcome back. I was trying to do like a very <laughs> different a tone. Thank a you. Fake. Yeah. <laughs> and we're continuing our conversation. Yeah, Paul Shear uh, would be proud of that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me riff for 30 seconds. Uh, Ed Horatius asks... We're, we're genuinely very big fans. True. Uh, why do EPL and European salaries tend to be described in terms of weekly income, while American salaries are described in terms of annual income? Is this a widespread convention, and what is the origin of the difference? So I've got a very quick answer to this. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's a widespread convention yep. in Europe. The origin of the difference is that when soccer was professionalized, it was professionalized not in the big money way that you see today or in the big money way that American sports were because mm-hmm. they obviously came later in a more developed country. Um, so they're essentially a lowish paying working class activity, right? So you would play a week of soccer, then you would get your weekly pay packet the same as you go down the mine, you mine for a week, end of the week, usually Friday, you get your weekly pay packet. Mm-hmm. So then you would get paid for the week's work, the same for soccer as you would for any other sort of working class job. There we are. And then that's I think, it. And then we've just stuck with it all the way yeah. up to people making £300,000 a week. And then my theory. How big are those envelopes? Large. Uh, my theory as to why, hopefully direct deposit, as to why <laughs> the American system is different, I think it's because of the salary cap. You have that in place. So people are always sort of looking at salaries against a, s- oh, a specific number every year. Yeah. So then you want to know exactly what that player is costing you in terms of space on that's the roster. Yeah. So you'll have those. And I do think it's also more headline grabbing when you have the player sign a two-year, $25 million deal and everybody freaks out. But then you look at what the actual cap hit is and it's really that's all if he does this, 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 and this, and this. Really, he's making $1 million. And then you can sort of understand cool what that means in relation to your team. Exactly. <laughs> that, that was an easy answer. I think so. We nailed it. We nailed I, that one. Yeah. It's not like us to be brief, but here we are. Thank you to Ed Horatius for the... Oh, sorry, mm-hmm. no. Thank you to Ed Horatius yep. for the question. Get it right. Anyway. Um, Richard Rolson has mm-hmm. the final question on today's show. He sure does. Richard Rolson wants to know, why does soccer only allow three substitutions? How did that come to be? Was it always this way? And do you think the game would be improved if there were more than three subs? If so... How many subs would you want to see in a match? Taylor, I know you've done the research on this one. Mm-hmm. But can, can I take my best guess before you well, answer? Well, I want to I strive to be even briefer than our last answer. So I'm going to say, uh, because it's right now, evolution, no, and yes. Done. <laughs> Here's my best guess. Yeah. Back in the day, there were no subs. You got right? it. You just played with 10 men if yes. someone got injured, right? More or less, yes. Then they slowly introduced injury subs. Mm-hmm. Then it went up to two subs. And I believe around the time of the Premier League starting, you started to be allowed uh, three subs in a game. But I don't, top of my ha- my head, have the exact dates. Mm-hmm. Am I roughly correct? You are roughly correct. Yes. Yeah. So basically, my favorite type of correct. Substitutes were initially perfect. <laughs> the technically correct. Yeah, the, the two sweetest the, words in English. The language. Hermes Conrad uh, <laughs> version, yes. Um, so initially, substitutes were squad players that could be started. So it was the idea that if you had 11 players but Daryl Grove was running late and you had another guy there, he could play until Daryl Grove showed up. I like that I was definitely starting. Yeah, of course. Obviously. Obviously. Nailed on starter. Um, 
In-game subs first implemented in qualifying for 1954 World Cup, and that hmm. was only for an injured goalkeeper. Wow. Uh, and then I think you could do one other injured player later on. It was codified as a rule in 1958, first used at a World Cup final in 1970. So it's taken a long Oof. time to have in-game substitutions. So if you got injured during the 1966 World Cup, if England had got two players injured in the final against West Germany, they would have just played with nine men. You got it. Ooh. Yep. No subs. Um, English leagues first adopted it in 1965. The first sub uh, was in that season. But the problem there was that it was only for injured players, which led, not surprisingly, to players faking injuries. So then they could be subbed out uh, either for tactical or fatigue reasons. Mm -hmm. So basically in 1967, they just changed it to any player can be subbed. Then it comes down to how like what the numbers were on that one. So yeah, to your point, uh, 1988, two subs allowed. Uh, and that was, I think, preceded by one sub and then another sub if it was a goalkeeper. So that's kind of how it always goes. So yeah, one yeah. sub and then one more if it's a goalkeeper. Goalkeeper's like the backdoor yep. addition of a substitution. Yeah, right? so then you go to two subs in 88, 94. You have two subs and one goalkeeper change. 1995, three subs without any restriction. There we mm-hmm. go. Um, also, so it's it stayed that way at least in uh, professional league soccer yep. ever since. The only exceptions I can think of are international soccer friendlies. Yep which were unlimited, Mm -hmm. and then they were limited to six, right? We're currently limited at six in international friendlies. Um, And, weirdly, the USL. Yeah. USL, up to two years ago, Mm -hmm. you could make five subs, which I believe was about sort of keeping the squad healthy. Yes, I think that's part of it. And then also, if you're trying to develop young players Mm -hmm. or younger players, that makes sense too. But that's Uh, no longer, right? Now we're back to three subs in the USL. But you do have the, I think in some leagues, in some situations, in some cup competitions, you will have, you can have a fourth substitute if you go into extra time. I do believe a couple different leagues have uh, started implementing that. Yes, that's the thing I I would be in favor of. Mm -hmm. I've got a few. I've got a few uh, with the question, uh, how many would you like to see in a match? Uh, one, I would say unlimited if there's, I think I've said this in the past, unlimited if there's a suspected concussion confirmed by a medical doctor. Then I really don't think it makes sense to punish a team for a player getting concussed, and I think mm-hmm. it leads to a player playing when he or she should not still be on the field. It's also hard to fake, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and also there's an idea that if you had, say, a neutral doctor who says, yes. yep, all the symptoms are there, mm-hmm. get somebody else on. So you mean unlimited as in if three players happen to get concussions, then you just get three extra concussion yeah, subs. I think exactly. that's a really sensible rule that should have happened five years ago. Yep, I think so. I th- and I like the idea of it being codified officially that uh, you get another sub in extra time because I think a lot of times if you're really trying to – so many times we've seen games that do go to extra time and we're both really excited about it, but it comes this, it almost becomes this like, oh, we're two minutes in and this is definitely going to penalties because mm-hmm. everybody's exhausted. So just being able to bring on one more impact player. I and think someone's would, inevitably slightly injured, right? Yeah, of yeah. course, of course. It's like a walking dead quality to extra time sometimes. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and then I've got a theoretical one. Late season walking dead, meaning not as good. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, that checks out. <laughs> I, I, I gave up on that show a long time ago, and I keep wondering if I should go back, and then I remember that I, no matter what, I'll be bummed out. I loved the first season. I mm-hmm. gave up when they just started shooting machine guns at each other all the time, and it kind of thought, yep. oh, this is not a zombie show anymore. It's just one of those machine gun shows. I think I gave up when there was like an entire episode to whether or not they could drink out of a well. And I was like, all right, <laughs> Oh, I'm see, good. I would I'm like good. that episode. I'm good on that. All Thanks, right. man. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, sorry, off topic. Um, but go, yeah, going back to this one, I've talked quite a bit. Also, you, wait, what's that bite mark? Do you... <laughs> Do you, don't worry about it. It's fine. Just give me give me an, a random amount of time, depending on whether or not I'm a main character. Um, <laughs> that's how it goes, man. You're not. Uh, well, then. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. So I do have one more thing that I wouldn't mind seeing in yeah. terms of additional substitutions, but I'm wondering if you have somewhere you think it could be changed. Well, so my one thing is, I, I worry now if you just added an indiscriminate extra sub or two. That at the top, top level, subs get used so aggressively towards the end of 90 minutes to sort of run the clock down and slow the tempo of the game. If you gave professional managers another one or two subs, you would definitely see them used in the 90th, 91st, 92nd minute to just absolutely kill a game dead more than they can do already. Uh So I really worry about that. Okay. Oh, I thought you had a solution for it. I don't. I just have a concern. The reason why I've been saying "Uh uh-huh like that is because I thought this was going to be another case of you and I being way too connected because (laughs) my theoretical one was you get four substitutions provided that you use one of them in the first half. That was going to be one of mine because I think – Does halftime count? No, it has to be before the halftime whistle. You can use one, and then you still have three for the second half. But then you're just asking to embarrass a player, right? That's fine. 
But I think I, it incentivizes changing it up if things aren't working because so often maybe, oh, no, we have set up way wrong and suddenly we're 2-0 down in the first 15 minutes, but we can't really change anything because I don't want to risk burning a substitute. Yeah, so yeah. let's just try to hold on. Let's all just try to sit back and bunker and get through to halftime. If this was a legislative process, yeah. I would introduce an amendment to accept uh, your legislation as written, accept halftime also counts for when you use that first sub. Because I don't feel like enough coaches use half. Remember we talked after Ira Jose's question about a week ago about how coaches probably should change at halftime, but they always wait till the 55th, 60th minute. So I would give them that extra sub if they use it at halftime, at the very least. After careful consideration, I've decided to approve your amendment. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's fine. That's fine. I think the only reason why I had hesitation with that is because it feels like something that already happens. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, to your point right now, if there's a change in the 33rd minute, it's either injury or something has gone horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Someone's played very badly. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Um, so the other weird thing is that right now I have my objections to go in above three subs outside of concussions, but I'm sure people had their objections back in the day yeah. as well. And I tend to be a big proponent of, we don't have to keep doing soccer the way we've always done it. And if you look back, we've always kept changing it, right? Yeah. I mean, we've I always think- kept changing it. So four subs wouldn't be a big deal. It would just be another step in the evolution. No, there will never be a clear... Like, also make the goals bigger. The, obviously. <laughs> or smaller and moving back and forth. Why not? No, I think there will never be a clear example of like positive change as when they remove the goalkeeper can pick the ball up yeah, from yeah, the back pass. The back pass rule, yeah. That... You go back and watch some of those games when that was still a rule, and it's just the slowest thing. Cause yeah, Because, yeah. I mean, imagine there's no – you can't do high pressure anymore. There's no way to do a high press system because you can just pass it back. Goalkeeper picks it up. Mm-hmm. What do they do? Just, just, like, run around in circles around the goalkeeper? Like, it doesn't work. So <laughs> that completely changes the way the game can be played, and I would argue very much for the better. So I think – if you're changing it for specific reasons, again, the concussion one comes to mind where it's reflecting what's happening in the world or what's happening in the game or helping to make the game better while protecting players more. I think all of those changes make sense. All right. Um, the one thing. But let's light the ball on fire. The, <laughs> two things, just I want to say. Um, what if, with the thing you talked about with the back pass rule, mm-hmm. what if teams started just cutting off the angle to back to the keeper? Maybe their pressure would be better. Because right now, part of a high press is. Teams won't worry too much about letting a centre-back pass to a goalkeeper Mm -hmm. because a goalkeeper is theoretically a worse soccer player. So you almost want them to pass to the keeper's feet so he can go pressure them. Mm -hmm. But if the keeper can pick it up, it would change the angle a little bit so you'd have to start cutting that pass out. Jesse Marsh could figure this out. Kind of, except that the goalkeeper can slide out and use his or her hands. So if you get it in the box, the goalkeeper's probably going to get to it. Oh, that's, that's what I say. It doesn't have to be to feet anymore. It has to be roughly right. in the vicinity of the goalkeeper. But what if Bradley Wright Phillips just stood directly between the centre back and the goalkeeper? That's fine, but then it, it requires another player to step forward, and now you maybe pull somebody else. Makes the press harder. It's just, it's just an adjustment. And even then, when the goalkeeper gets it, I have to believe that there weren't rigidly enforced rules about how long the goalkeeper was allowed to hold it so uh, then yeah. that again slows things down considerably okay I just liked, I enjoyed that clarification there we go yeah uh-huh. it's a very uh, civilized legislative process overruled overruled <laughs> zombies don't get votes this whole court's out of order <laughs> I don't know what to say here <laughs> we've answered all the questions we have that was fast we're, we're brief like that we're, we're pretty good well right? one of us is the <laughs> other one tends to ramble on at length if you would like to support the Total Soccer Show, mm-hmm. um, you can go to totalsoccershow.com slash join. I was the rambler. If you subscribe at $10 a month or more, we guarantee to answer one of your questions per month on the Total Soccer Show. You also get a player in the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. That you do. And we have several to discuss, report upon today, starting with Kenny Saif. Uh, scouted by Stephen Kopech. Uh, Kenny Saif is the 24-year-old year, 24 American midfielder on loan at Anderlecht from Ghent. During Anderlecht's midweek match against Standard Liège, Saif was subbed off at halftime with a bruised knee. He started again this past weekend, but was subbed off after just 15 minutes of play. Stephen says that it's unknown just how severe the injury might be, but promises to keep us posted. So that means we might not see him for the U.S. in the May and June friendly. It's possible. Mm. Sticking with Belgian news, Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't in the scouting reports, but Ethan Horvath played for Club Bruges as they won the Belgian league. He's back. He got two games towards the end of the season. This is progress. It is. Except that we have a report on Emerson Hyman later on, and it does feel like maybe the last game of the season when things are kind of sewed up. Now, if it was Club Bruges had to win that game to win the title. I actually don't know. I don't know the state Mm -hmm. of the Belgian title. Or was it just like, yeah, sure, why not, kid? <sighs> Jose Andres uh-huh. Soto is scouting Jesus Ferreira, the 17-year-old. 
<laughs> Jose Andres Soto is scouting Jesus Ferreira, the 17-year-old American forward for FC Dallas. Jose says, after having had a late preseason procedure for a sports hernia, Jesus Ferreira was sent on loan from FC Dallas to USL side Tulsa Roughnecks. The good news is that's already getting some experience, playing 68 minutes in his first game available. The bad news is that he was witness to drug by reminding everyone that he's still fantastic, scoring a 40-yard free kick as one of five goals that Phoenix put past Tulsa in a 5-1 win. You should probably like stand in front of him when he's shooting. You just, probably just, should. But maybe not put your hands in front of you if you're Daryl Grove and you're trying to be tough. Oh, can we talk about this? We we had the whole yeah, handball. Yeah, how you were wrong. Yeah, sure. No, no. So I still think my rule could work that handball is just if it hits your hand, it's handball. Uh-huh. With the only exception being you are allowed to protect yourself. The okay. only exception is if the player was protecting his body, he's allowed to handball. See, now you're adding an exception. But just Suddenly, the one. how do you define protecting yourself? Just the one. What if... Like, what if I have glaucoma, so I want to shield my eyes, Daryl Grove? What if I have a history of that in my family? If you're dumb enough to put your hands over your eyes when playing soccer, then... I'm just saying, man. I don't know. I, I'm just trying to protect myself. That's why I had to handball the ball off the line. I feel like you're not being sincere. I am not. <laughs> um, Tristan Gilliland Kunkel scouting Derek Jones, 21-year-old American midfielder on loan at Bethlehem Steel from the Philadelphia Union. Derek started and played the full 90 for a third straight match as the captain of the Steel, losing 2-1 to one against the Charleston Battery. This was the most confident Jones has looked on and off the ball this season, says Tristan. He started several attacks uh, with great through balls and provided the team's only goal when he converted a penalty in the 65th minute. All right, Derek. Colin Bish is scouting Eric Williamson, the 20-year-old American midfielder for the Portland Timbers. Eric was named man of the match, says Colin, after scoring the last-minute game winner in T2's 1-0 win over Seattle Sounders 2 in the Cascadia Derby 2. Um... (laughs) <laughs> Eric Williamson's goal oh, no, that one is literally also <laughs> that's what they actually have also written out <laughs> Eric Williamson's goal came from uh, Victor Arboda excuse me Ob- Obeleda excuse mm-hmm. me Victor Arboleda chasing down a loose ball in the corner and putting in a perfect cross which Williamson hit on the valley it sounds like he's finding his stride mid-season but it remains unlikely that he gets many MLS minutes this year mm-hmm Russell Varner scouting Alex Mendez, 17-year-old American midfielder for the LA Galaxy Academy. On May 10th, Alex Mendez was one of three LA Galaxy Academy players named to the USU-20 squad, set to face Honduras on May 17th and then again on May 19th. Mendez has clearly impressed during training with the Academy side and his limited playing time with the LA Galaxy too. He joins teammates Aristotle Zaris and Ulysses Yanez in the camp. I gotta say, he is the least interestingly named of those three. <laughs> Aristotle Zaris is a really good name right aristotle ulysses and alex yeah (laughs) jeff and sam huffman are both scouting a lot of of greeks in there i didn't really realize that Mm yeah jeff and sam huffman are both scouting mcquelle akele the 21 year old american attacker for vrl c jeff and sam say mcquelle ended the year with two sub appearances in vrl c's final three games of the season in total he made 29 appearances all season scored three goals and was the oldest player on the team that's not always a good thing um, with that in mind, it seems likely he will move on this summer. I've been hearing this about Mikel Kelly a lot. Yeah, let's hope he actually does move somewhere. Let's do. I have to add, though, I'm thinking about this now. Alex is probably short for Alexander, would be my guess. Which is we talk about Alex Mendes. I'm going back to this for a second because okay. I'm going to say the famous Alexander in human history is Alexander the Great who was Macedonian, but famous for being Greek, so it counts. Mm-hmm. So then you've really... I think, you've got, it's ha- I think it's Hamilton now. You've got three Greek names in there. Alexander Hamilton is the most famous. Get out of here. So you've got three Greek names. I like it, is all I'm saying. Well done, LA Galaxy. Keep, rec- keep recruiting historical <laughs> figures and mythological figures. Why not? Uh, Richie Garcia scouting Emerson Hyman, the 21-year-old American midfielder for Bournemouth. Emerson finally made Woo! his Premier League debut in Bournemouth's last game of the season. It was all worth it. It totally was. Manager Eddie Howe said of his performance, quote, Emerson made some key interceptions to break up Burnley's attacks. It was going to be tough for Emerson since he has not played it much. He used his name twice. That makes me feel like he doesn't actually know who he is. <laughs> he showed quality and composure on the ball. His league debut was not given to him. It was earned. End quote. Thanks, buddy. It just took two years, says I mean, Richie. Heinemann was injured mm-hmm. for chunks, including in preseason this year. I have heard conflicting reports of mm-hmm. Emerson Heinemann's performance. Okay. So Eddie Howe says he liked it. Yep. I saw edited highlights mm-hmm. of all like highlights as in the good stuff that Emerson Hyman did I thought it looked kind of good there were some mm-hmm. tackles interceptions and some nice 
simple passes, like spraying the ball out wide along the floor. But I've also heard reports yeah. that he was a little nervous and some misplaced passes yeah, as well. Or just, or just like maybe not as like sharp on the ball, didn't control as yeah. quickly or as like well under control as maybe would have been expected for a midfielder starting in the Premier League. So this is what I think I said to you earlier that this mm-hmm. is one of those things where I, if I'd had an extra hour this week, I yep. think I would have spent it watching Heinemann play for Bournemouth, but I just wasn't able to carve out mm-hmm. 59 minutes to watch Emerson Heinemann's Premier League debut, but I really wish I could. I mean, what else do you have going on? Russia, <laughs> Egypt, <laughs> Uruguay, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Dylan Viach is scouting <laughs> Kai Havertz, the 18-year-old German midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Sorry, Kai. Dylan says Kai started in the number 10 role in Leverkusen's 3-2 victory over Hanover, but the victory was not enough to earn a top four finish and a Champions League spot. Kai's final tally in the Bundesliga, three goals, nine assists in 22 starts. On a non-soccer note, ooh, I like a non-soccer note, a recent Bundesliga article featured an interview with Kai in which it was revealed that he's very into music, he plays piano, um, is not so good at, quote, maths, unquote, which is the correct way to say it, and is closest with Julian Brandt. They live very close and do something together that almost every day i gotta say that's one that i would have fought you on previously but in thinking about it it should be maths it should be plural you're not wrong it's weird well okay it's mathematics Mm -hmm. right so the actual shortening of it could just be math because you're just taking the first half of the word still plural though you don't you don't abbreviate a plural thing into a singular oh okay a win for the english i mean i think so Uh i think so also it's hold the fort the fort doesn't float wait what the fort doesn't float. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's not hold down the fort. Oh, thank you. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was really confused. I was like, is that a saying? And you Are there could, floating fortresses? Is and this you, the Avengers? You couldn't care less. If you could care less, then you Ooh, care some. That's, that's still one that gets me. I don't like that one. You don't like that one the British way? I could care less? Yeah. Oh, if people say I could care less, I'm instantly like, oh, so there are other things that you care more about. Gotcha. <laughs> you okay, it's a grammar nerd. Yeah. 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 Uh, that one, I don't know why that one bugs me so much, <laughs> but it does. Let's move on from me being a huge dork. Nick Becker, scouting Sergei Milinkovic Savic, the 23-year-old Serbian midfielder for Lazio. Sergei Milinkovic Savic. I expect you'll hear more about him Several different times this summer. <laughs> SMS scored a late goal to tie the game in Lazio's 2-2 draw with Crotone on Sunday. It was a scrappy, right-time, right-place finish that almost secures Lazio's place in the Champions League next season. The rumor mill is now linking him with a move to Tottenham, whom Nick supports. But Nick thinks it is unlikely that SMS ends up with Spurs for a number of different reasons, uh, ranging from Spurs are maybe looking for a Dembele replacement, Mm. not another number 10. Also the fact that it's probably going to be a bidding war to get SMS. Maybe that's not necessarily a thing that Tottenham are looking to do. However, uh, Nick takes heart in the unless, fact that... Unless Pochettino has his way. Well, there is that. He yeah. says, give me all that hundreds of millions. I'm going to put it all on SMS. See, that was pretty much what it's going to yeah. require, I think. And the Spurs board are like, no, it's all iMessage now. And also SMS liked... I, mean, I just keep saying this because it's a, it's a long hyphenated name. Uh, he did like Michael Carrick's farewell message. Uh, so that means he's moving to Manchester United. So done deal. <laughs> However, uh, Nick takes heart in the fact that TSS picked Sergey as one of the possible breakout players at the world cup this summer i mean don't take too much heart because we also picked jonathan gonzalez well there is that <laughs> steve, and by we i mean me i was gonna say steve renard is scouting yuri tillemans the 20 year old belgian midfielder for monaco steve says monsieur tillemans played 80 minutes in a more advanced midfield role again but was mostly invisible in the highlights package shoulder shrug emoji uh Dara, uh, uh, since it's not <laughs> i'm gonna... not sure we needed that scouting report <laughs> Since Jonathan Gonzalez won't be at the World but Cup, thank you, but thank you, Steve. I want you to keep an eye on another uh, like young Mexican player. We haven't really talked about much lately, but I do think he could be a breakout player. His name's Rafa Marquez. Rafa Marquez. Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, he's he sounds inexperienced <laughs> and really nice. Uh, <laughs> final report comes from Robert Newman. I'm not at all connected to the drug trade. <laughs> oh my god, that just fell by the wayside. That story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might need to revisit that one. Uh, Robert Newman, I can't believe that. He might end up being the breakout player in Russia. Wow, that's good stuff. That wasn't, We didn't even work on that one, but I applaud. Robert Newman scouting Mason Mount, 19-year-old English midfielder on loan at Vitesse from Chelsea. Still laughing. Mount scored again in Vitesse's 2-1 victory over Den Haag, which allowed Vitesse to advance to the Europa League playoff final. Three days later, in the first leg of the playoff final, Mount scored the first goal in Vitesse's 3-2 victory over FC Utrecht. Utrecht. Uh, Unfortunately, this is the last time Mount will suit up for Vitesse this season, as he picked up a yellow card in the match and is suspended for the second leg of the final. Uh I have to say about the scouting report, it made me feel like I was time-traveling briefly, because we did the... uh, 
the Andrea Novakovic report, and yeah. I kind of combined those into one. So I yes. kept waiting for this to go south yeah, yeah. and then forgot that it's two different teams. Yeah, so uh, Vitesse is yeah. Europa League playoffs, yep. right? Whereas mm. Telstar, Telstar Novakovic is uh, promotion playoffs. You got it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did the same thing there. there it's go. very hard to keep those things It really in is. Yeah. It really is. There are many scoutees in the scouting network. There certainly are. But we thank everybody for the scouting reports today. Mm-hmm. Um, if you Again, if you would like to support the Total Soccer Show, um, it is Total totalsoccershow.com slash join if you support us at $5 a month or more we give you a play in the scouting network if you support us at $10 a month or more we guarantee to answer one of your questions every month unless the question is terrible <laughs> but usually they're not usually, usually they're, they're, not. they're not yeah <laughs> so thank you again to everybody Taylor we're going to go do more research for our World Cup Group A preview which we'll publish Thursday in which we will also reveal our DNA after we got our DNA tests from Ancestry DNA. It sounds sinister. It does, right? It sounds a bit like Westworld. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, until then, I'm going to say thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again on Thursday. Thursday.